uh, going to kind of break them down by um, corneal anterior segment, this you know, dysgenesis, and congenital glaucoma. Um, so the pediatric cornea is smaller than the adult one, and it's something we can look at to kind of tell us um, uh, about the eye. Uh, and a kid who can't get to a slit lamp or an infant. Um, the normal corneal diameter of about 12 millimeters, the kids get to that at about age two. A, a diameter of a newborn is about nine and a half to ten and a half. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the disorders of corneal size. Megalocornea is just a kid with a big cornea who doesn't have glaucoma. Um, it's most commonly X-linked recessive. Uh, these kids do have an increased risk of glaucoma. I don't really know the mechanism there. Uh, anatomy, um, but you have to dis you know differentiate this from uh, congenital glaucoma. You know, if you see a new kid with congenital glaucoma, it's for sure going to be a hazy cornea, so that's usually your biggest uh, you know, clue. But checking their pressure as well. This is usually not progressive. Keratoglobus is when somebody has a thin cornea all the way over. Um, they have a pretty deep anterior chain where they can get uh, spontaneous breaks and have acute high drops um, from breaks of decimates membrane. Um, they can be easily ruptured by minor blunt trauma. The saddest case I saw in residency was a guy who was an attorney in San Francisco doing really well. He had lost one eye as a kid. He got hit in the eye with a baseball and his wife elbowed him in bed and he lost the other eye and came, became completely blind in a day. It was awful. Um, but he had Ehlers Danlos, that type six, so he's uh, it's associated with that. There's so many types of Ehlers Danlos, and I feel like it's getting more common, or people are just getting diagnosed more. But um, he did have some hearing loss as well. He had some hearing aids, but uh, pretty sad case. So the, those people uh, have a really uh, thin cornea, and you know, just with minor trauma, can rupture their globes and have a lot of problems. Keratoconus um, is when the central cornea has progressive thinning and bulging. Um, this usually in families in which it runs, you know, you start seeing it during adolescence, a little more in boys. Um, associated with Down syndrome, probably because they rub their eyes as well as atopic disease, they rub their eyes. Um, you know, you guys know a lot about these treatment. Usually we start with RGPs. It's certainly not in kids with Down syndrome. We just kind of watch those kids and manage high drops if we need to, um, uh, you know, DALC and PKP are surgical options, but we don't do those in kids. And this usually doesn't happen to so much until adolescence anyway. Acute corneal high drops is what you see in those kids sometimes when they have breaks <coughs> and decimates membrane from that progressive thinning. Um, you know, in general, yeah, you can get this a little more with eye rubbing. Um, earlier age or more se severe diagnosis, allergic disease, is usually self-limiting. Big thing, um, yeah, treating with lubrication, saline drops to kind of try to pull some of that fluid out. People hate those saline drops though because they're so, uh, they sting so much. Cycloplegics and topical steroids. Microcornea is when kids have less than a nine millimeter uh, cornea, less than 10 if they're older than two years. Uh, this usually happens embryologically after the fifth month of development. Um, can be autosomal dominant, sporadic, bilateral, or unilateral. Can also be associated with other ocular abnormalities. Um, yeah, just for these kids, you gotta make sure to get a refractive correction, especially if it's unilateral, because they'll be anisometropic, and treat their associated amblyopia. Sometimes they can have, uh, you know, pretty good vision if you treat the amblyopia appropriately. Um, Developmental heredity, uh, just, these are just some pediatric corneal opacities that you can see, a little bit more rare. Scleral cornea is when you have an opaque uh, cornea in distinct limbus. Um, in contrast to Peter's anomaly where you have the opacity centrally, usually this one that's clearer centrally. Um, usually non-progressive, don't do well with PKPs, usually bilateral. Um, you know, it can be sporadic or hereditary. But yeah, if you transplant that cornea, it will just grow back over because they don't have the, you know, distinction of the limbus. So don't usually do so well. So you just try to manage what you can, see if you can get any vision out of it. Um, 
I had a kid a few weeks ago that I thought he just had a, because I could never get him to the slow end, but I could have a, I always thought he had a cataract, because, you know, you would see in his retinopus, retinoscopic reflex that he had kind of a disc in the middle, and I sent him, and uh, then finally when he got a little older, he, he had a really high prescription, and his vision's about 20, 30, 20, 40, so not too bad, and, but he's um, still a young kid, and uh, I sent him to Mifflin, and Mifflin says it's just a really, uh, uh, a really mild scleral cornea, which is kind of interesting, I've never seen that before. Peter's anomaly is when these kids have a central leukoma. You know, oftentimes that white thing will be connected to the lens, but not always. I have a lot of kids like this who are like an incomplete Peter. So sometimes, and it's usually kind of where like you see a coloboma, but you'll see a lot of kids just have like a congenital haze in that area. And I think it's just a really mild Peter's. Um, you know, you always wonder when you see kids like that, do you, how much of a workup do you need to do? Like, is this interstitial keratitis or whatever? Um, the big thing with those kids is they usually have crazy anisometropia just because their eyes developed differently. You know, I, so these kids I have with Peters um, are pretty um, uh, far-sighted hyperopic. But this, so they have this central leukoma that's due to a defect in decimase in the endothelium with iris adhesions, and sometimes you know it's connected to everything behind it. Often, you know, connected to the lens and everything. Um, they are more likely to have glaucoma, probably partially just because they're missing part of that angle on that. You know. Too, but they probably have some dysgenesis as well. Um, they can have some other cardiac, craniofacial, and skeletal anomalies. Um, I don't see that as much. Can be sporadic and, and uh, bilateral, um, map to PAC 6. Um, you can treat these with the PKP. I have seen in residency we had somebody who kind of liked to do that. It's just so hard to manage a kid with the PKP. They often just fail and or open up or have other problems. Uh, I have seen some people do these optical iridectomies. I know Dr. Jardine had one recently that he was thinking about doing that, where they just cut a big hole in the iris and hope that they start using that part of the cornea as well. Um, and far, as far as treatment, you have to just treat their amblyopia. These often get fainter over time, so you know, although it looks horrible at the beginning, it may get better over time, but that doesn't help with your <laughs> amblyopia much. Um, but yeah. Do they tend to have neovascularization? I just had a little kid that NICU that I got consulted on, and I was like, first look, I was like, oh, it looks like a Peters, and then like they had this superior neovascularization. So like, I don't think so. So more likely sclerocornea cornea than. I, don't the, I haven't seen that too much, but I. No, I don't think they usually do, but I could be wrong on that. The ones I've seen haven't so much. It was probably more like a scleral cornea. But I have had a lot of kids, and I didn't even realize, a few of them at the beginning, I didn't realize it was just, you know, kids who just get a funny opacity right in that area, and you think, well, when you first start, you're like, what is this opacity? Am I missing something here? And then you kind of realize that it's just kind of a mild Peters, and I have a few of them like that. Limbal dermoids, you see these a lot in kids with golden haars. They get this choreostoma, the strat strat stratus of limbus, usually in the infratemporal quadrant. Uh, sometimes they can get hairs and things that usually kind of comes up a little bit later. Um, usually, no hereditary pattern. Um, they do get a boatload of astigmatism, and it usually kind of goes like this, like this way against you know that one would be kind of going this way, if that makes sense to you. <laughs> like that, your reflex would be more this way, and you get more uh, with the real astigmatism. You you know you so can is it flatter like so that astigmatism is that. It's like Isn't steeper this way usually. I can't explain why. Uh, <laughs> that's just what I know. <laughs> but yeah, you'll get more more sill like if this is infratemporally, then you'd get it like more at like uh, 75 or 70. Um, you can take those off, which most people like to do. It's a little better to wait until people are just a little bit older. They just graft some cornea. They just graft an elliptical piece of cornea in there. Um, but visually, it doesn't help them because they still have that funky astigmatism. I mean, it changes, but it's still funky. Um, so that's the big thing. But I've had, I have had several of these kids that actually have pretty good vision. So even though they'll have like three or four diopters of sill, if you catch it early, which you usually do because parents bring them in because they have this funny looking thing on their eye, um, usually they'll have them on both sides and it's just worse on one side. Um, yeah, the big 
thing is that you can graft them. People always want them off, but it's better to wait till they're a little older. Just like I said, PKPs, kids can just open them up and then you lose the whole eye. So it's a little better to wait until they're a little bit older, but they still have some a bunch of astigmatism. Ched, I've never actually seen this, but they like to ask about it on um, boards. There's two different types. The recessive, which is more common, presents at births. It's non-progressive, where the day is almost dominant. It's a little later progressive, um, where they have photophobia, progressive, and no nystagmus. Can be similar looking to uh, congenital glaucoma because they have, um, you know, a hazy cornea. It's usually diffusely thickest, thickened and edematous. Obviously, they'll have a normal pressure and probably not so much uh, megalocornea. Uh, congenital hereditary stromal dystrophy is autosomal dominant. It's very rare. I've never seen this one either. Non-progressive clouded cornea, um, but they have a normal epithelium. There are a lot of these mucopolysaccharidoses, which they love to ask about on the OCAPs. Um, they're treating a lot of these with uh, stem cell transplants and things now. Uh, hurlers, I feel like is a pretty common one. Um, they later in the disease get some RPA degeneration and optic atrophy. Um, it's most of these are autosomal recessive um, and have these you know later changes in the back of the retina as well. Um, I've never seen anybody treated with a PKP, but they can um, and can get some associated glaucoma. I have a, a handful of these kids with cystinosis. Um, uh, where they have these uh, deposits in the cornea and they can treat this with this topical cis, this drug, I don't really know exactly how to say it, but you have to get it in the mail and you can even get it through CVS, but you have to put it on like six to 10 times a day, but it really does work. <laughs> I have kids who they put it in it and it really gets rid of all those crystals, but um, it's a pain because you have to use it all the time and it has to be refrigerated and then I had one kid that was kind of getting worse, and then mom said that the drug manufacturer contacted her and said the last three batches had been ineffective, like they had done something wrong to them. So it's a little bit, um, yeah, and it's exceedingly expensive, but it does really work. Um, these kids have, you know, lots of other issues as well. They're usually kind of little kids can have some progressive renal failure. Sometimes they're on some other drug that makes them smell really funny. <laughs> like, you, like you're in their room and you're like, oh, something smells weird, but it can be the drug that they're on. Um, they say they get this, but I haven't noticed that. Um, and it, I haven't seen it change much when they're on those drops, but they really can get better with this. And some of these kids are treated with this later, but I have the kids I have that have this, I have not been treated with bone marrow transplant. But they like to ask about this one on the boards too. Syphilis, uh, you always wonder about this in kids who are born with, you know, who have a, uh, who, not born with, sorry, who have a, you know, some kind of haze, especially if they have kind of an unknown birth history or from a different country. Uh, they have rapidly progressive corneal edema. You know, we don't see this very often, but they do like to ask about on the boards. Big treatment is uh, steroids to decrease the inflammation and uh, penicillin. Uh, these f f familial dysautonomia uh, or Riley Day syndrome, kids have a decreased corneal sensation or neurotrophic keratitis. They're kind of like a diabetic foot. They just have a bad cornea. Um, I have one kid right now with Mifflin that doesn't have any other of these other symptoms of Riley Day, but just has um, no feeling in her corneas at all. And she got this huge scar on one eye and has lost one eye and now she's starting to lose the other one. And it's just so sad to watch because what do you do? But yeah, she just, you know, gets has no impulse to blink and just rubs her eye and then starts getting a little abrasion and then it you know gets infected and turns into a big corneal scar and then your hose so pretty sad pretty weird deal but um, and I've never seen that before in like a normal kid without any other issues but Mifflin said he's seen it a few times I mean obviously you worry in any kid with neurotrophic keratitis about uh, herpes because that's the big thing that can cause it but um, you know and they ask about this Riley Day syndrome on the boards and things but I have a really normal kid recently who had it who's really sad to watch. Um, any kid with haze in their cornea who you don't know why you always wonder about herpes and just start them on acyclovir just in case. Um, you know it's a pretty low uh, side effect profile on that drug. Um, you know, any of these kinds of herpes viruses can, can cause problems in kids. Um, 
Um, yeah, so you s it's spread from your skin and then it stays latent in there. Most people are affected by, you know, are affected by it by the time they're 70. It's everywhere. <laughs> people are always worried about it being dirty or whatever, but it's just everywhere. You know, you're more likely to get it and more likely to get it bilateral if you've got atopic disease or things like that or kids who are immunosuppressed. But, you know, it's just so common and if you get it in your eye, it's just really bad luck. Um, congenital herpes is pretty awful. Uh, affects about 1,500 kids annually. It's usually acquired during passage through an infected GERD canal. These kids look pretty awful. We had one recently, somebody saw that was pretty nasty. Uh, yeah, you saw that one, yeah. Um, you know, the big thing is that they get these other CNS disease and it's pretty high mortality. Um, uh, you know, it's increased risk of getting it if you have, you know, prolonged rupture of membranes, use of scalp electrodes. Um, invasive obstetric procedures where they put those monitors on and things like that. Most mothers are asymptomatic. Um, yeah, and you just want to make sure that they get on high dose uh, uh, acyclovir. Herpes sig is pretty common in kids, um, often asymptomatic primary infection, so that you know you won't see the dendrite or anything. They'll just come back with a you know stromal scar. Pediatricians are just remarkably stupid about this one. So, I mean, I've had kids referred for like a three month um, orbital cellulitis. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not what's going on. Uh, but yeah, just like any red eye with haze, you know, um, but it's pretty common and it's pretty easy to pick up just with a retinoscope too. You can just see that haze in there. Um, Classically, you know, you get this epithelial keratitis first. I don't see this in kids as much. I don't know if they just don't get it or they don't, you know, you don't see it as much, but, um, uh, you know, you classically see these nice bulbs and they look really pretty and you see them a lot in residency because people come in because their eye hurts like hell. Uh, but usually in kids, yeah, you don't see them as much. You don't want to put these kids on steroids, these people on steroids. Most resolve spontaneously. What do you guys do here? You put them on antivirals or what? Just watch them. Do you breed, debride it at all? No, just watch them. Yeah, I don't know. There are different different fields of thought on that. I think it's pretty awful to put ooh, anything on eight times a day. Um, some people will treat them with oral say acyclovir. I can't figure out the head study because I feel well. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, we talked a little bit about interstitial keratitis. Um, it's this hypersensitivity immune reaction, can get some neovascularization. Um, you gotta treat it with a really slow steroid taper. Oh, we talked about interstitial keratitis in, in syphilis, not in this. Um, discofor discoform, these people you know, have an endotheliitis, get a, one area that's really swollen. It's also a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, can be associated with, a, you know, increased IOP and some KP. Um, they can get a necrotosing keratitis, I've never seen this, but uh, it can be pretty awful as well. And you also get a carrot. I mean, herpes can do everything, it can also cause a keratouveitis. They come, often get these trophic ulcers or things later because they don't, you know, they're neurotrophic. Um, can also be made worse by those topical antivirals, which is why some people don't like using those. Um, this is a little bit about the drugs. In kids, I almost always just use acyclovir because it comes in a nice suspension and it's easy to figure out. Uh, the older kids, it can be nicer to do valacyclovir because you know you don't have to dose it as much, but it's just easier. It's oftentimes I'll just dose it three times a day and then keep it, you know, for treatment and then. Um, dose it back to two times a day when they go on maintenance. And usually, um, yeah, so I start at 40 to 80, somewhere in there, divide the TID and then for 10 days and then usually go down to BID for maintenance. Um, these kids usually need to be on it for about a year because they have recurrences common and it's usually <laughs> when they go somewhere on vacation and stop taking the meds. Uh, after they get that, they get some they get, you know, different astigmatism, so they get some amblyopia often from, you know, the astigmatism or from the haze or from both, um, and you need to treat that as well. Oftentimes, you know, the amblyopia isn't too bad because this usually comes up later in life and they've already had a good few years of establishing good vision in it, so, and it's usually just 
it's astigmatic, but it can be several diopters and like against the rule and just can be kind of funky that way. Uh, vernal um, is just a seasonal allergy. I've got a few kids now that are pretty quiet in the winter and I know it's gonna start flaring up in a few months. It's you know more common in males, usually resolves by puberty. Usually, you know, I see a fair amount of these like Somali refugees and things or, you know, immigrants from Africa who um, get these crazy Horner Tranis dots and I get really bad uh, vernal. Uh, in the Caucasian boys, usually when they get bad vernal, they'll have the bad cobblestones and not so many of the Horner Tranis dots. Yeah, it's more common among African American. It usually gets way better the second you put any kind of steroids on it, but um, the second you take them off, it comes back. And so trying to get these people to take Claritin and Patinol and get everything is hard because the steroids fix it so fast. And why would I say on anything else? So um, it can be hard to uh, compliance wise. Um, the kids with a bunch of cobblestones, oftentimes they'll get some corneal changes and get drop some of their vision and get some scarring as well in the central cornea. Um, you know, when they get those big cobblestones like that, they get that thick, ropey white discharge that they just can't clear out because those cobblestones don't make it so they can't blink very well. The big thing is to, um, uh, yeah, just get them on an oral antihistamine, topical mast cell stabilizer, and then use steroids for the acute phase, but it can be really hard to do that. A lot of the books say chromalin. I've never actually used that. Mifflin doesn't like to use it, so it's hard to get and things. So I usually like to use Patinol because it has a mast cell stabilizer and a H1 blocker. Zanador, I think, just is an H1 blocker. I can't remember, but I usually prefer to use Patinol in these kids. Um, the big thing is it just comes and goes, and they kind of have to taper, you know, work on getting their steroids right, but you just worry that they're going to overdo it on steroids. But you kind of have to a little, you know, err on the side of doing more because when they start scratching and scarring their cornea, you can't get that back. Flictenules are pretty common in kids. Um, people get all weirded out. I get pictures from uh, my friends who are general ophthalmologists sometimes being like, what is this? Because <laughs> they don't see it as much. But usually they're, you know, temporally or infratemporally just a white thing. They're just a hypersensitivity reaction. Classically in the books they say, or in the tests, they want to ask about this because it can be hypersensitivity to TB, but most of the time I'm sure it's just a staph. If you put steroid on it for a day or two, it goes away right away. Sometimes it comes back, but it usually kind of peters out. Um, they get better in like a day or two on steroids. Anterior segment dysgenesis are bilateral congenital hereditary disorders that affect the anterior segment. They've done lots of genetic stuff on this. I've I'm not even up to date on that anymore. Um, posterior embryotoxin you see commonly in kids, just as that white, whoopsie, this white line here, visible at the, at the slit lamp, it's a displace, an anterior displacement of Schwalbe's line, but a lot of normal individuals can see it, but can be associated with, you know, Axenfeld's anomaly or allergies. This GI is diagnosing like crazy these days. I, they didn't used to, but I know seen a bunch lately. These kids come in yellow with lots of uh, jaundice. Uh, the big thing on them is, yeah, I was trying to check their pressure, but um, usually they get a pigmentary retinopathy that is comes in that comes on later, so you aren't going to see it in these two-year-old kids they're referring. Um, posterior embryo, so Axenfeld, so these syndromes, Axenfeld's anomaly is the posterior embryo toxin with iris processes to the scleral spur, which you can see on gonioscopy, but I don't ever 50% of them can develop glaucoma and it's usually autosomal dominant, so you just want to keep seeing kids to check their pressure, which is a lot easier with an eye care. Rigers, these are questions they ask on the boards, but they're pretty rare disorders. Axenfeld's plus iris hypoplasia, 50% of them develop glaucoma, can be associated with FOXC1, PAX6, and these other uh, genetic disorders. Riger syndrome, these kids have a characteristic appearance. They you know, usually have small teeth, hypospadias, a little short, on, and some maxillary hypoplasia. Allergies. So this biliary hypoplasia, so they, there's, I'm seeing a lot more of these kids lately and I really don't know why, um, but they always you know, are wondering about this, but it usually doesn't come up till later, so I actually haven't seen this in any of the kids that I've been referred can't have some of this. I 
just saw one of these last week who has, uh, you know, has allergies, so she has Axenfelds and Corotopia and other kind of funky things. And Iridia, the big thing you're always worried about here, and they'll ask about on the boards, is it can be associated with lagger. Uh, these kids usually do not see well because of this. Whoops. Their phobias don't develop, so they usually have nystagmus, um, poor vision, corneal panis, and stem cell deficiency. You know, they start getting hazy corneas. They often have cataracts, too, that are kind of clumpy and funky. Um, some can have this, I don't see that very often, and the big, they can also develop glaucoma, um, you know, due to a variety of mechanisms, or not really known why, is it because their angle didn't form, because their iris didn't form, or is the one stump there that's blocking the, you know, directly meshwork, or is there some kind of uh, increased episclerovenous pressure because the fluid doesn't drain as well. Um, Aniridia, oh, so yeah, the big thing you're worried about, most of the time when you see this, it's just autosomal dominant due to a PAC-6 mutation, and it's pretty easy to get genetic testing. If uh, you can't, you have to screen these kids with repeated uh, abdominal ultrasounds every six months um, just uh, to screen for Wilms tumor. These kids are pretty photophobic. Some kids with these, you, do, you can get them where you do have an okay phobia. I have a few kids with okay vision with this. Um, they often have a lot of astigmatism. Um, usually when they need a lembal stem cell transplant is much later in life. Uh, you just definitely want to watch them for a glaucoma and get them hooked up with vision services because the nystagmus and the phobia hypoplasia causes a lot of vision problems. Um, I see a lot of kids with colobomas. Um, you know, classically they can't have problems with pressure just depending on how much of the angle it involves, you know, how much is involved depends on what their vision is going to be. It's part of the continuum that extends to microphthalmus and anophthalmus. Um, can be surgically repaired, although most people don't. Do you need to look for systemic things? I usually don't unless they've got some, like, other drastic medical problems, but I don't usually send these kids for charge. Bob says that when you have these kids with charge, usually their colobomas aren't as bad. Um, but they can be associated with many of these other problems as well. But I usually just kind of leave that up to the pediatrician if they have other uh, things. These kids can have is this, these kids can have really pretty good vision. I have one kid who was referred for surgery as a young age because the the coloboma the you know was dragged really down. Or if you know you can get kids with funky irises and they can still end up with good vision just because they're able to adapt to it. So just because that's pulled all the way down and when you put a reflex there it's like right in the middle of the iris doesn't mean that the kid won't have good vision because they can kind of move their phobia uh, inside their eye and things. So um, uh, don't give up on vision and most of those kids even when they're it's pretty funky displaced have pretty good vision. Um, especially if uh, you treat their associated refractive error. Sometimes these kids can have um, some sill uh, just because that eye doesn't form appropriately, so they are much more likely to have astigmatism. So as long as you treat the anisometropic and, you know, anisometropia, even if their iris is dragged pretty far off, you can still end up with pretty good vision. Neurofibromatosis, I see tons of these kids, um, you know, and they're always wanting us to look for lish nodules in kids who are like a year or two years, which you're not going to see lish nodules. Um, and I often don't even try to get them to the slit lamp because it's a traumatic experience and you're not going to see them anyway. You can look with the 28, but those are hard to see too. So, um, you know, they're looking for the, that, those lish nodules as part. They're, these are usually kids where it's a questionable diagnosis and they're looking for, you know, to solidify it. Um, but parents just need to be reassured that the, these are hamartomas that are more common in the inferior iris, increase with age, but do not cause any vision problem, and they're only a curiosity for diagnosis purposes. Um, these kids get, you know, the big thing on them is they get um, optic nerve gliomas, which is not, you know, an anterior segment problem, but um, they can often, I have at least one patient that I followed for a few years and didn't realize that they'd had a glioma diagnosed previously, but she had some anisometropia, so that glioma had pushed that eye and made it more hyperopic. So sometimes these kids who have anisometropia have to wonder, like, is that really true or is there a glioma there that's causing this? Um, and it's not usually a big deal because the ones that are static don't usually change as much, but um, 
it's kind of, if you see a kid with anisometropia, you have to wonder if they do have that. The other thing on these kids is, after they're about age nine or 10, we don't worry about those optic nerve gliomas anymore, so you don't have to follow these kids as closely. Congenital glaucoma is always the thing you worry about. Um, uh, pretty rare, um, but can run in families, especially if families have it. Um, you know, these are the classic tears and decimes. Uh, Hobstrias, they're usually horizontal, just like the, eight, the line in H, which is how you can remember, as opposed to vertical, theoretically, in, in cases of forceps trauma. Um, but they're usually just kind of funky, like they aren't necessarily, I think, horizontal. But anyway, uh, these kids, you know, are born with um, uh, hazy corneas, they can't have blepharospasm, eye rubbing. Uh, high pressure, if they have an increased cup to disc, that can get better with treatment. You can have a big corneal diameter that stays there forever. Um, and this is something we always kind of watch in these kids, and it's hard to check their pressure and things or to kind of know what their pressure's been, but it's, they're kind of moving progressive myopia. You wonder about that. I have a kid who um, has a ectropion, like uvia, and I didn't realize that that's can be associated with glaucoma, but I had been following her and her pressure had been fine, and then all of a sudden her pressure was out of control, and then over the course of like a year, she went three diopters myopic in that eye, and she was about four years old. So they say that that can't happen later, but it can. So um, that's kind of a good thing to follow, or you can follow, it just can let you know, you know, if you get a high pressure in clinic to wonder if it's real or not, if there's anisometropia, it can tell you that, yeah, if it's been pushing on that eye, it can grow bigger. Uh, you can also get glaucoma, you know, congenital glaucoma in these other anterior segment disorders where they don't drain fluid as, drain fluid as well. Um, can also be seen in some of these other syndromes. Although I haven't seen glaucoma in those. Lowe's, yes. Sturge Weber, yes. The rest of them, not so much. Um, so you check their pressure if it's high. Uh, you know, and when you're doing an EUA, you want to do it soon after injection before the anesthesia meds start altering it. Um, gonioscopy, it can be difficult to recognize, recognize landmarks because they have that big membrane that's usually covering the TM, which is what you slice open with a goniotomy. Um, uh, they can have a thickened trabecular meshwork, peripheral iris, stromal hypoplasia. Uh, you want to look at refraction, you know, and treat amblyopia, especially because it's usually a bilateral disease, or even if it's unilateral, yeah, then you're gonna have some differences in anisometropia and look at the nerve and cornea. Um, when you see these kids in clinic, you usually wanna start them on, you know, Diamox till we can get them to the uh, OR, one to control their pressure, one to try to, the other one to try to clear their cornea to make the surgery uh, a little easier. I usually do, you know, 15 mgs per kg per day and TID, so just five mgs per kg per dose. Um, uh, you can also use topical beta blockers, can cause some apnea and hypo, uh, hypotension. Um, I'm seeing that now a lot more in kids who are on these uh, timolol or things for um, hemangiomas. And you want to avoid alpha-2 agonists in all kids just because it can cause some behavior changes and some CNS depression and things, which is actually pretty common. Surgical treatment, a goniotomy requires a clear cornea. You just incise the trabecular meshwork and try to, you know, get rid of that big membrane and open it up. Uh, trabeculotomy, uh, you know, you use when the cornea is, you know, you can enter Schlem's canal with this big trabectome and you kind of thread it, you know, in here and then pull it in, rip it into the uh, AC. It causes a lot of bleeding. Um, I think people aren't doing this as much now. They're doing more of these thread it through with the uh, nylon suture and then pulling it in the middle. Yeah, this one, trabeculotomy using that pro, sorry, proline suture. Uh, you can't get into the suprachoroidal space and cause a lot of problems. Uh, they can decrease that risk by, you know, following that, uh, you know, to make sure you're not sticking your probe all over the place, following that little lighted sensor, which is what they do usually. Uh, they can do that a time or two. Um, you know, if the angle suture repeatedly fails, they can, you know, go to a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, uh, later, you know, or a tube shot implant, kind of just depends on this, <laughs> the surgeon, what they like to do. 
or you know they're doing a lot of these sometimes these ciliary especially in eyes that don't see as well um, ciliary body destructive procedures so the TCP or uh, the one where they shoot endoscopic These kids, you just always want to try to treat their amblyopia. You never know which one's going to end up to be their good eye at the end. And sometimes their uh, good eye is less myopic, so can be the um, worse eye in terms of amblyopia. <laughs> I've had that happen a few times. So you're pat, you know, patching the, the one that doesn't have as bad a pressure, or hasn't been operated on, and things. They start to get amblyopic because it's the less myopic eye. So don't be fooled into thinking that because they have glaucoma in one eye, that's going to be the amblyopic eye. And if that's the case, then you really want to treat it because you don't know which one's going to end up being the good one at the end and which one's going to survive till the end. Uh, some of these kids can have pretty awful disfiguring bupalmos. I've got at least one girl that has really crazy, a couple kids who have just, you know, crazy bupalmos from that. Um, in summary, all of these disorders, you know, just require long-term follow-up. That's the thing about peds. You don't know which one's going to end up being the good eye at the end. You don't know how they're going to change over time. Uh, their refraction's going to change, and most of them just need patching and glasses and things because it's not usually symmetric between the two eyes. Sorry, I don't have a... I didn't rewrite my lecture. Next year will be better. Mm -hmm.